It's another way of saying that everything within the cosmos is simultaneous, is that ideas leave out their source. There is no gap, there is no space in between events, a span of minutes or seconds or days or months or years that separate events because ideas leave out their source. All events are of the wrong mind. There is no gap. You know, we were just reading the line that for time and space are one illusion which takes different forms. If it has been projected beyond your mind, you think of it as time. The nearer it is brought to where it is, the more you think of it in terms of space. So time and space are just this, this little gap in between cause and effect. And the teachings of the Course, and the teachings I'm teaching, are that there is no gap between cause and effect. And if there is no gap between time and space, there is no personhood. Because that's where personhood is. It's in that gap. It isn't. It isn't. Well, it seems to be. <laughs> that's where it is, but it isn't. Yeah. The subject God, object keeps... split. Half hour could be so crucial, I bet, huh? It's like I'm running to catch up here. Hypothetically. <laughs> <laughs> you want to say that in another way? Well, he could say it in many ways. The subject object split that we talked about can only be equated with that gap. It's, no matter how you come at it, you just have to see the impossibility of that gap. The whole teachings of the Course is there is no gap between cause and effect. The whole teachings of the Course is that there is no such thing as linear time. But by hanging on to linear time, personhood, I hold the gap. And I'm standing here like this. Cause, yeah. effect. Yes. <laughs> Hold them, pushing them away from each other. It's hard, but I can do it. To use the example of the hub or the teaching learning sessions where I say, you know, bring all of your adjustments, bring all of your logistics to the hub to see that, that there aren't any. You know, the whole point of mysticism is to keep coming and coming and coming and going and going and going towards that point where you see that cause and effect aren't a part and there aren't any logistics to handle. You know, it's even the things that we seem to be doing as messengers of peace, you know, preparing a whatever, a, a, a cover page or a, a art for the front, um, sending, preparing applications to send into the IRS for nonprofit status. Everything that seems to be done in the world is, is perceived within the, the basic assumption that cause and effect are separate, that you have to do certain things to have other things happen. That if you do this, then this will happen. If I apply for nonprofit status and I fill out all the forms and do this and this and this and I really am persistent with it, then nonprofit status will be granted. Cause, effect. If I plant a seed plant some seeds and I put them in fertile soil and I water them and there's sunshine and there's rain, the seeds will grow. But how does that say that, why is that showing that their separate cause is separate from effect? Because one is happening before the other seemingly in linear time. Cause okay. always precedes the effect. Yeah. Okay. And what the teachings of the Course are and what we're coming to see is that's ludicrous. The world of images is, are, is a projection of unreal effects that are coming from this unreal cause. If you think about the, the, uh, the projector, the motion picture analogy where, you know, there's the projector and then there's the film going through, which would be the false cause, mm -hmm. and then the images that are seen on the screen at the movie theater, those would be effects 
of, of the projection of those images. But if the film's not real, and the, therefore the image, if the film is an unreal cause, then the images are an unreal effect. But when you're watching a movie from a deceived point of view, it seems as if, you know, how the mind gets identified, as if it's right there in the movie, and it starts feeling startled or happy or crying and doing all these things because it believes in these false cause-effect relationships, and it really believes that people do things to other people. And certain objects, you know, like in science, for every action there is a reaction. The mind really believes in the reality of that. So that's why when you go really deep into this stuff, it, it can start to seem disorienting. And Tom and I were talking about on our walk today is at times there can be these disorienting moments where it, the world is, as one has known it doesn't seem to be as it was. Things are not as they appear to be in the world. There's nothing in the world that, there's not this cause in the world that's producing this effect in the world. It's all generated from my mind. The cause and the effect, that's where they're simultaneous. It's all in my mind. So the thought of a cause, the effect goes along with it because this, you know, ideas leave not their source. If the idea is in my mind, mm -hmm. that's what's generating it. That's where it's coming from, then the effect is there as well. There's nothing in the world, it's not like having the thought produces something in the world and then the cause and the effect. I guess the question that I am at then is, um, how does knowing this help us out any? I mean, I guess what I, and what I would ask is, do you, is it even a valid question to ask, do you experience differently? Because then I'm assuming that you're a person. You don't have to assume that I'm a person. Okay. Just think that there's this symbol. Whoever I'm speaking, speaking to, to now, do you experience <laughs> it it's differently? It's not even whoever. It's with the clarity of mind, mm -hmm. with the right mind. How is that perceived? Yeah. That's that's a that's a question. But that's still. I want to know. You want the experience. I want the experience of it. And I want to know if that's possible or you know and and not well yes or meaningful the, yeah if this is what you will experience you know written down doesn't help me out right. because yes. that's still you know i take that and say well you know that's possible that's a possibility but if, if i don't know how to right get now. there then it doesn't help me and how is this helpful to us you said how is it helpful is it's it's a goal is peace of mind or the peace of god which we've stated and you can formulated in different ways in the mission statement and so on and so forth, joy or however you want to look at it, freedom, whatever, then this is the most practical thing. See, the recognition, the realization that cause and effect are not apart is, is eminently practical in the sense that that is the state of peace, that is the state of restfulness, that is the state of contentedness, that is the state of joy. It's the state of pulling it all back to the mind, too, and not seeing that cause and effect out here in the world as something separate. Yes. The whole purpose of time is to see that there is no linear time. It can seem like, oh, well, that's a mind-bender kind of a statement. But, but while, you know, that statement we just read, don't project it to time. Time is as neutral as the body is, except in terms of what you see it for. What is the purpose that I have for time? You know, what is, what am I using it for? David then gave two examples. The second example was that of advising someone who had great resistance to the idea of drawing unemployment to apply for benefits. He did so as advised. However, when found ineligible for benefits, he thought having done so was a waste of time. But it's all about the healing of your own mind. I could tell that there was resistance that you were having. Going and having the holy encounter with a woman with a German accent, was that a waste of time? Was getting in touch with the resistance of the feelings that you were having about being in that office when that was coming up? You know, 
nothing is a waste of time. No perceptual image, no event or circumstance is a waste of time if you use it to get in touch with what you believe and how you perceive the world. Anything in that sense can be used for your healing to start to see that cause and effect are not apart. So you can see that those, those are like specific examples of, of just getting back, back, back and starting to, to move into the experience of I don't know what anything is for. Where you're not trying to think that I know that this is the way things happen in the world, so if I do this, then this will happen. If I do that, then this will happen. You know, that's, it takes a lot of effort and strain to hold on to that kind of a conception of the world. So, to answer your question, what's, what's practical about this? Joy, peace, happiness, rest. That's the state of mind that comes from the recognition that cause and effect are not a part. That's, that's the experience that you want. And when we go into these metaphysics, it's just to, to seem to bring the mind to that experience of that. It's not to get into a bunch of deep philosophical metaphysical stuff so you can go pontificate and go around the country and come across philosophers and professors and prove and you know how deep you can go or how, how fancy the words can sound and all this and that. No, this is eminently practical because this is about coming to the awareness of peace of mind. Another way of looking at it is if if you start to really come to the awareness that the script is written and that there is no cause and effect in the world, well, that takes all the struggle out of life, you see. What, what would you be striving for? What would you be striving to attain in the future? If you can really come to see that cause and effect are not separate, what a joy. And there are no results in the future. Yeah. That's what all striving is for, future results. Future results, future outcomes. You know, I've been saying over and over that to me, I have this feeling and this experience that everything is complete now. Messengers of peace or no messengers of peace. Nonprofit status or no nonprofit status. Um, tapes, journals, teaching learning sessions, travelings of the country, coming together with people or no coming to together with people, no journal, no teaching learning sessions, this and that. It's all the same from this perspective, from this state of mind. There's nothing that has to evolve or unfold. Yes, those metaphors will still be helpful at times. But more and more, what I want you to do is look at, to go beyond the metaphors. I want you, you know, to leap into that experience. That's what you really want. You want the experience. You don't want the words. You want to go beyond the words. We'll pick it up with, do not project this fear to time, for time is not the enemy that you perceive. Time is as neutral as the body is, except in terms of what you see it for. What is my purpose for time? If you would keep a little space between you and your brother still, you then would want a little time in which forgiveness is withheld a little while. And this but makes the interval between the time in which forgiveness is withheld from you and given seem dangerous with terror justified. Yet space between you and your brother is apparent only in the present, now and cannot be perceived in future time. No more can it be overlooked except within the present. Future loss is not your fear, but present joining is your dread. Well, that's a good sense. Future loss is not your fear because it sure doesn't seem that way. Oh yeah, if the mind believes in linear time, future loss seems to be big time. Mm -hmm. Primary source of fear. <laughs> yeah. But present joining is your dread. You know, that's that experience of um, 
A lot of times people feel